How's it going? Okay, I'm back. Sorry about the state that I left the old calculator in. I did some really dumb stuff, and I realized it after I went and laid down and was about to go to sleep, and then it crossed in my mind. And I was like, what did I name those comments above those functions? And of course right here I named, this is very obviously an input function I named output. Um, but I thought, once again, sometimes I just have to laugh at my own mistakes and think like these are perfect stupid examples of what goes wrong. And with comments, one of the biggest things that goes wrong with them is that they get out of sync. So obviously I made my comment out of sync right out of the gate, but that could happen in so many other ways too. Something could change and somebody's just gets used to seeing this like, um, maybe like sort of just some picture hanging on the wall. I remember when moving places, I used to go back and do that final check of like a room and then realize like, okay, I've vacated the entire room, but um, there's like still this poster on the wall or something or a picture on the wall that I had like, I was so used to seeing that on the wall that I didn't even realize like, you know, don't forget to grab that. Um, that's what I see these comments that they can turn into something like that. And then you just might not even realize they're there anyway. So anyway, what the trick is, is to make the function reflect whatever I was just doing this ad hoc, just to sort of like define what the different sections were in code and stuff. But you want to really make, we want to really make, um, these function names say whatever the comment's going to say for the most part and everything else at least in python and there's different doc string um, documentation comment methods in different languages obviously but in python you you'd like describe any extra details about the function right there that would be the, like the proper format to do that um okay So this is not built with TDD yet, test-driven development. We just went over the mislabeled comments. There's too many reasons for this file to change. So finally, um, maybe you've been, if you're following along with this, you've thought like, why don't you break this out into other files? And there's a lot of reasons why I don't. In the beginning, I like to try and everything should really be justified even if you don't like i'm obviously taking a lot more granular steps than a lot of people would especially a lot of people of solid experience but i'm trying to demonstrate it and i'm hoping that in doing so i'm already learning a lot myself or at least reinstilling a lot and learning a lot um but also that these little granular steps should be able to scale to bigger problems so by trying to concentrate on like, oh, that step seems so easy to just overlook and like, why are you gonna stop and like make such a big deal about one stupid constant variable or something? And it's like, that could represent, that constant variable right there to me represents like an entire configuration file. It could, you know, where we move that little, that one little constant variable can scale out to be so much more than it really is right here but by keeping it just that one little value that's all we have that's the only cognitive load we have to carry around is like oh decimal places in some little format string okay so you know instead of like oh that's a config file and it's a yaml file and was there nested objects and you know there's not like anything crazy like that to so that's just to kind of justify it in case you're wondering like why why is this so stupid? It's like it's intentionally stupid. And then hopefully the dual benefit of that too is that people with less experience can grab onto it a little better. There's less expectations to know about like to be able to just balance pagefuls of code and um, complex data structures and whatnot. Okay, so the too many reasons to change things. So it's basically where these, where I've labeled off these things. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and correct this one and save that. So this is actually the output down here. And this can go right there. So this is kind of like our main entry point right here. And it comes in and it calls the input function. So you just draw an arrow up to there, boom, calls there, and does that. And then that loads up this um, this identifier right here to point to a list or a dictionary, basically, of um, which is a lot like an object, especially if you're thinking in terms of like JavaScript or something like a dictionary can, uh, if I jump over to an interpreter here, In Python, you can literally just have like name equals and then a value inside of some curly braces, which is a lot. What did I do wrong there? Oh, I guess I forgot the exact syntax. So it's like the JavaScript object literal notation. And then you can see it's like that. So that's a dictionary in Python, in case you're not familiar with it. And that's kind of, I mean, I could have used an object instead and obviously had a very similar effect. I try not, the objects are usually a little bit heavier, a little more, maybe one more line of code or something to initialize. So if there's like a built-in in a language, a more primitive type, I'll usually just go ahead and... Um, like in this situation, I just go ahead and pick the dictionary, but we very easily, and maybe I'll do that. I need to kind of roll at a faster pace, pick it up here. But I'm just trying to cover every little end, obviously. So what we need to do is break out these pieces to change. And I'll just start doing that. So this in where I put input up here is actually this is the processing when I was saying input processing and output and I don't like the name operate I picked that because I was like okay we're making a calculator and I can't say calculate you know I've got to say what is the calculator doing it's operating or you know and then I was thinking of these operators so I was like okay I'll just real quick pick operate but um, now it makes sense to me to call that calculate so I want to go ahead and change that. And early on before the interface is really used, that is the best time to just, if it's going to read better and be more descriptive and specific about what it is, like the sooner the better that gets adjusted. And then use whatever search and replace facilities. We'll do, um, see if we can even find it. So we want to find operate. So there's operate. We'll change that. It won't let me. Is there another one? Invalid operator. All right, it's just that one. So that'll be calc. Save that and go ahead and hit F5 to run it. So hit control C to break out of it. Looks like it's doing all right initially. Okay, so I changed that to calculate. Now what I'm going to do is uh, whatever I name these up here is the module that I'm going to bust them out into. And that just means a different file because right now if we change like we want to add a GUI. And so if we change this file to add a GUI, that's one reason to change. That's one concern. And if we want to change the input mechanism, or that is the input mechanism for the most part, the way we're concerned right now, um, if we want to change the back end processor, that's another reason to change. If we want to change this calculate function, like how that works, which is different from the graphical. So on the different levels of things, um, 
if you know if they're going to change based on like whether or not it's run on mobile or desktop or if it's going to change based on there's there's all different levels of concerns that it can change on so once any concern seems like it's going to be it have any be a concern you know it's actually going to be of concern then that's probably the best time to think about like splitting that out into its own file and you don't have to worry about like the very first time you visit everything don't worry about like should i be does this need to go right now am i going to fall behind in my emergent architecture if i don't do it no you won't but eventually technical debt is the interest that you incur by not doing things by like if we just sat here and just rolled this statement out really huge you know um to go back and refactor that like later if we decided oh you know what we're going to actually um make a class for each one of these operators and you know we're going to do it like that so there would be a lot more typing and reworking code that was had already been typed it wouldn't just necessarily be like a simple search and replace type of thing so um i mean maybe a really advanced ide could take care of that but that's where technical debt is things like that and just the whole cognitive breakdown of like what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and having so much more muck to get through so yeah i keep talking and keep forgetting where i'm at so we'll just break this out into like some processing file it's just going to be in its own file just say new file paste it in here and save it and we'll just call it processing processing I can't tell if I spelled that right or wrong now. <laughs> okay, and then we'll get our our good old input. And same deal with that. Just break that out into a new file. Oops. And this was part of initialization. I didn't mean to cut that out. Oops, uh, control save. And, and this is the main entry point. So we have our input, our processing, and then we got to put our output right here. We need to put that in its own file too. Oops. <clears throat> okay. So now we have our input, our processing, and our output files. And this calc file is our main entry point. So it's going to come in and do the initialization, and then it's going to go ahead and get the input. I kind of screwed up because I actually wanted to start out and do TDD with this, and I was just taking my time. So I'm going to hit Control-Z like as many times as it will let me. Not quite that far. Control-Shift-C. Where are we at now? Main entry point up. Okay, I'll save that right there. Okay, so uh, we still have all this stuff copied out to these other files, but we're back pretty much to original here. I left this change to calculate and the correction on processing. Um, input main entry point output. Okay, now we're gonna we're gonna start TDD in this thing. So really, I shouldn't have done these just yet, but we'll just pretend like I didn't. So file, 
new file and this is going to be the test file and it's basically going to be just like the main calculator program like our test file is going to be the driver program that's going to drive these little component modules um, which if you look at our calc program that's what it's doing well once we stripped it down to where it was just this that's what it's doing is it's just driving those modules it was just doing that initialization and then driving the modules so with that being said instead of like that's the user interface to do that or that was like our manual user testing interface so now we want to create an automated testing interface for doing this an automated test setup so we'll save this file as in that just in the same folder to uh, keep it simple and we'll call it test and we'll just call it test calc for now um, a bigger program it would probably be better to call each one like test input, test output, test processing, but we'll just keep it simple for now, test pi. And uh, any big project, you're probably going to bring in some testing framework or something, but you don't have to. You can create your own little simple framework like this and get effective test-driven development out of it So uh, without too much complexity. So what we need to do is import the files that we care about. And even though we've called this test calc, it's kind of a misnomer because since we're keeping it simple, we don't really want to like test the calc file. So that's kind of bad practice on my part. or should come up with like a different way of doing that to keep it simple. But um, maybe that does. Because then if we break it out into other files, we could still call them test processing. Anyway, um, we're just going to test each one of these things. So we need to verify as I delete these things out of this file. OK, we will start out testing calc, actually. We'll make sure it works. So we'll import the calc file. And then we'll call calculate, and we'll give it an input. And so what we'll do is we'll call def test calculate addition. And so this will just call calc.calculate. And what if we need to send it a dictionary? What were the dictionary values? They were, it's going to be op num a and num b. Calculate op. So we'll just send it op as a plus. Just keep it really simple for right now. Op is a plus. Um, Num a, you guessed it, is a five. And then just an eight to be really adventurous. Okay, so that's going to calculate all that. What do we expect that to equal? We need to assert that calc.calculate equals 13. And then we'll come down here. Actually, we'll just go ahead and save, control save, and then run it. What am I doing wrong? Oh, because it's that was the other thing I needed to address too. So this thing down here, this main entry point, isn't in a function. So even when we import it, what it's going to do is that import is going to run all this code that's against the rail right here. So anything that doesn't have any sort of indention is against the rail. Um, that would be these function definitions, that will be this while block, 
all that stuff is going to get parsed. And so um, anything that's not just like a function or a class definition that's right here, just open code like that, is going to be executed and carried out. So what we can do is we can say um, in Python, you, there's a little common convention that's if the name of this module um, is set to main, then we call them, we'll just put all this in a main function like that. And then we can say def main and put all that over. Oops. All right. That really shouldn't have looked that hard. So we can come down here now and put that right there. So what it will do now when it comes into this file is it will do this because it's against the rail. So it's going to parse that constant and then it will do this function definition. So it will memorize this function signature basically and then it will come in here and um, just pull all that into some you know bytecode in memory or whatever and have that ready to execute if this one of these names gets called okay so let's go ahead and test run that ooh operate is not defined I must have not must have done too many undos calc you late okay okay that seems to be working all right so now if we go over here so what should happen is when it loads this in it will load all that stuff into memory and then when it gets down here this is against the rail it will run it and it will be like this name is not main it's being loaded as a module not as a main entry point so it won't run this so we'll just have this loaded into memory and then we can call these by prefixing them with calc or if we wanted to we could in python you can say import that or not as star but you can say from calc import star and then you would just be able to call the functions as, as if they were defined right in this file Anyway, let's uh, save and run it. And all good. So this would basically be like a um, just one one passing test right here. Oh yeah, I didn't call it. So we define all of our tests and then against the rail we call our tests or we can put them in a main function and do that whole thing too but I don't plan on importing this test into anything and maybe if I do um, maybe I would like it to just run all the tests if it imports it I don't know but by not making that decision yet if I think about like what will that cost me to not make it now versus what will it cost me to make it in the future um, whatever decision I make, I might change in the future. So until I know more about it, it's it can be a good thing. If you procrastinate about the right things, it can be very good. And that can help to not procrastinate about the wrong things, which are actually the right things to be doing, right? Okay, anyway, we just gotta call the tests we want. So we want test, calculate, addition. We wanna call it, and this is how we run it. So save and run. Assertion error. Calc dot calculate. So what happens if I call calc dot calculate and then it 
this calc dot calculate not returning it's returning a string that's right so if we look over here calculate takes the inputs and then down here result which is a string and I'm expecting a number yeah because I'm I'm testing like does that equal the number 13 and that would be highly unlikely I think the only way is if they return the letter that has like the ASCII value 13 that's the only way that might ever pan out so which I think is the enter key or escape or something like that so very unlikely anyway or maybe if we just hit no okay so what we that brings up another thing that I forgot to even put in here was that this uh, formatting like doing that as a string perfect example of where test driven development like exposes those kinds of weaknesses like right out of the gate because that was something that I was trying to like think like how could I introduce this concept and you know I don't want to add too much confusion early on or whatever like trying to maintain that whole balance and so I thought well I'll just leave the formatting in there for now and then when it rears its ugly head then I'll deal with it and right now it's already rearing its ugly head and this is the thing is like um, sort of the opposite of how I've been like taking like double steps maybe than how most of us would to go through like developing this kind of thing I'm like stopping with every single little step uh, test driven development is almost like like skipping or like you know taking every other step because you're just able to just so much stuff just as you just go like that will just be like bam 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 you just get all those problems right out of the way right then and there um, it's just but it's not the be all end all it doesn't like give you architecture but it gives you so many signals to drive that architecture that it's just like if if you're paying attention if you're looking for it, it will just feed you so that can be a beautiful thing and then it reinforces itself by once you make that change it says hey that change is now working and then it it may monitors that change and makes sure that it continues to work and that nobody comes back in and messes it up and if they do then they have to answer to that test and say you know either change the test to make it fit their new value where they're making this full on conscious effort to do that um, which is almost like double entry accounting if you think about it because you're making the change in the uh, you know more of the business logic code and then you go over to your test logic and you have to say yeah go ahead and make that change there too so it's a really good system all the way around um, but anyway so we have this now and now we're gonna have to do a bit more refactoring than we thought so and this is why I shouldn't have jumped ahead up here and pulled out all those files so <laughs> this is gonna be fun so what we can do is we can just extract out this decimal places thing out of here and get this out and result will just be a number after that because we won't convert it to a string so I'll just do that so this is in my opinion this is rework technically because it's um we're deleting code that we can't just like within very few seconds you know do like a quick find and replace on or something like that type of thing so this is like whatever and it's minimal rework though it's not like a huge deal we caught it quick um, so these kind of this is like one of those on the fence things where it's like yeah it's not ideal but you know what when we were just prototyping to see like whatever that was quicker and we we didn't know you know maybe they would have been like oh we wanted a a radio instead of a calculator I don't just being hypothetical right okay and so this else result isn't gonna work um, we're gonna have to figure out something else for there so what can we return for a result we can just say else result equals none just kind of like a null in Python 
So, and then the other thing is I could have just probably just pit return here instead of building up this variable coming down and returning a result at the very end. Um, that's just a matter of preference or taste and, and mood, you know. So I just chose to do it like that. So that all looks, that should return a number now. So I'll go ahead and save and test that over here with my test driven development test. And now we got the dot, the passing dot. So that's good. And, but now it's gonna be unformatted when it goes to the display. So there's our input, our processing. Okay, so now that this processing works, I should be able to just copy this, like cut it out of here, go over to this processing file and replace that one with the slightly improved one. Come back over here. <clears throat> Instead of import calc, I'm gonna say import processing save and run that I think I have too many windows open or something what's going on okay save that file processing result Okay, trying to run this one more time. Name calc is not defined. Oh. So I'll just say, for now, it's probably not the best idea, but from processing import star. Okay, so there, now it's working. I just needed to change my names right. So that's cool. So now, this will import that. I could even really just, I'll just leave it there for now. I'm gonna call it processing.calc though. I don't wanna pollute the namespace that much. Make sure it still runs, cool. I'll test passing on that, so processing. And that right there tells us like, okay, processing works. And that also already starts giving some hints into like, well, how thoroughly do we feel like we've tested processing? We've tested only one operator, you know? So we wanna maybe test like that every operator, anything that if it gets changed, you wanna know about, you want some flag to get raised. So like if somebody changes that to a dash I would probably want to know or if they just removed it and made it to where you can only do the backslash so I'll put a test in for it and say you know just like I did with whatever just do a little basic division test with it um, and speaking of division divide by zero so then of course zero one two negative one negative point zero one like you could really get carried away with all those, but honestly, it's like, hey, forget about it. Throw them all in their own file, all the stupid little ones like that. Anything you think of, um, my little rule of thumb is that if you want to test something more than once, like if you're ever, so yeah, if you want to test some weird, crazy number once, go ahead and do it and just see what happens, right? But if like maybe that pops up an error and then a few days later you're like you know what i'm going to test a really weird crazy number again because that one popped up an error that's saying hey write a test for that you know that's something that if there's ever any reasonably possible chance that that's going to come up again just write. i mean you could write like five lines of code or something and that's it and that would pretty much guarantee that so Okay, so let's get this going, get the input over there. So the input, we'll test that in our test, and it's get console input. So 
So we'll import calc again. Come down and add a def test. Get console. I'll just say console input. I'm kind of changing up the naming scheme for testing. You'll probably most times use a totally different naming convention for testing than you would for a regular program. Uh, test console input for a dictionary. Um, I'm not even going to do a real test here for it. I'm just going to print. Let me look at it. So this is also, this would scale out this idea of like, this is basically legacy code. Once you write something, close it, walk away for five minutes, whatever arbitrary rules you want to think about, like once you've walked away from code, so to speak, it's legacy code. So this code right here is legacy code and especially untested code, right? Like a lot of times that's described as legacy code in just modern times, like modern codes tested legacy code isn't or something. So what we're doing is we're converting this legacy code to TDD code. Um, so we're going to get back a results dictionary. So I can't even think of like what the uh, we'll check that the operator is not something check that the operator is not a dollar sign or something um, assert that calc Okay, and then we come right down here and do that. And if we don't want to run, let me go ahead and type this one in real quick. Test console. Thanks a lot, autocomplete, for not being there when I need you. Okay, so we go to this one and just comment it out that's how you enable or disable a test in these little manual should probably be a little bit more pep eight about this okay so that's how you would disable the test really there's no harm in leaving it running but I just want to demonstrate that so I'm going to save this what it's going to do is import that calc file and it's going to come it's going to memorize this one even though we're not going to use it and then it's going to come down here memorize this one then it's going to come back up here call this one it's going to assert that when it calls get console input um, that that doesn't return a print dot and this is really a bad example of I mean that right there like that whole layout's not too horrible yet but when I run this it's going to actually ask me for input which normal test driven development should be automated so it shouldn't be asking anybody for input so it passed with my input. Now let's go ahead and try and run it one more time. And this time I'll pit five and then a dollar sign and then a five and it passed. Why was that? Oh, the console input results. Results. that console input um, operator. There we go. Okay.
and then it, it throws an assertion error which is what we wanted right here it just passed it's like oh big deal you know you threw that I'm sure the calculator will figure out what that means but we know that like that's not cool the calculator at least not this calculator not now isn't gonna uh, work with that so we've caught it we've just thrown a generic assertion error so what we can also do is um, when it raises an assertion error it just it basically calls like where'd that go so it just literally says raise assertion error and then it does that right there and we just right here <laughs> assertion error it's just like in Python shell zero line one da 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 it's just it's nothing right so it's just generating one of those and we can come in here and put my uh, my error message and then you can see right here it prints the error message with the assertion error so you can be more descriptive on what it is so you can get the info of where it happened um, yeah alright so let's go ahead and put in a little bit of a description here and the way in Python you can shortcut that by just doing a comma and then pitting that description you want it to pass into that assertion error so this will be like um, the string would be invalid operator and this can be an expression right here too so like say you want to do like 10 invalid operator tests you don't have to go and type that's for that dry principle and this another one of those things all this stuff scales uh, it's a small and big you do, if you're typing invalid operator or copying and pasting that that's a clue this is an expression you still have the Python programming power at your disposal you can go make an expression that um, you know you can like say for one thing you could just make it be an invalid operator constant like invalid operator equals um, you know invalid operator right and that might seem like really redundant like and it like at, on face value it totally is like why are you gonna that's ridiculous I personally I get upset when people do a bunch of stuff like that but if there's a reason for it then go for it you know if it actually has true value and it's doing something more than just like adding all this stupid abstraction um, this for internationalization would work out nice some languages frameworks whatever have their whole deal where they have a preferred internationalization method maybe but it's probably something along these lines where you're just gonna pass it some constant and then you can change that and everywhere where that constant is you can just change it on the fly or maybe it's not a constant maybe it's whatever kind of a variable but that's just one example and another example is that um, it could get generated by a function a function could return some string you could make a function call right here and that function could do whatever processing from within this little eco world you have right here in your testing environment and it could go do whatever and come back and return a string there so even if you just want to put the time and date there whatever like that kind of a stuff so let's go ahead and run this real quick five dollar sign five and there it is on the very bottom Python starts on the bottom so it's assertion error invalid operator so that's a little better I'm never really a big fan of like all this bright lettering that's always trying to scare us off I still to this day get scared of it and turn around and run and then I have to go back and like if you've seen any of my other videos I'm probably more times than not misread the error messages but just because I don't want to look at them like any longer than I have to but somewhere in there that information you need is always there you know so the more time we take with that I think the better so this kind of just like shows I think that right there that's that's test driven development in a nutshell I mean if you just repeat that process and do the same thing you would in other stuff like um, obviously this is input and this is processing 
you know so we really should right now probably it's already seeming like the cognitive load I want to do like I could just like move these import statements wherever I want usually best at the top of the file but I'm wanting to comment again I'm wanting to comment and say right here like processing which I can do for now it's a smell but we can do it and this is what this is input so and I want to call this test processing and test input and then these are um, what tests to run like that so as long as we're not like setting values out here, this probably shouldn't be any big deal to just run them out here in this global space. But otherwise, that can get nasty quick. But for right now, to avoid the overhead of putting a few more tacky lines of code in there, I'm just going to leave it like that. The beauty of empirical justification. Okay, so what do we got over here? That worked with this file. We know that test is working. So now we can get rid of that. Save it. Come over here to input. Okay. Go back to our test file. Now we should be able to change that to process, not processing, but input because it's in the input file now. Ooh, input's a reserved word. So the trick with that is to add an underscore. Either abbreviate it come up with synonym or add an underscore and I'm just gonna add an underscore for now so don't be freaked out by those if you're not used to them or get used to them whatever close that for now so now I need to rename that file so I'll go to input and the trick to uh, to rename a file you have open at least an idle maybe in a lot of other stuff is to go to save as and then rename your file right here input pi and then save it then click on that again and it changed the name down here and then save it yeah replace it okay now we're that file and if we go to save as again you can see there is only the input with the underscore and we are now using that file so anyway that's one way to do that then we need to, of course, import it right here, too. Um, one thing is to not be scared about failing tests, or, like, that's part of test-driven development, is to enjoy that. That's how you, that's part of making progress. So we're going to go over here to our test, hit F5 to run it. And there we have the insertion error invalid operator. So that's good. And if we come back over here to our test and rerun it again, and then we'll do five and give it a good operator and make sure that passes. And there it passed the passing dot. Okay. And really, if you are converting legacy code over and you are just doing a little ad hoc uh, testing framework like this, you could if you wanted to leave the old tests in and come I mean feel free to experiment with that of course and like get do whatever you want and whatever make sure that like one of the main things with test driven development especially if you're using it in like a business enterprise setting whatever where the whole point is that sort of redundancy that guarantee that each byte so to speak is going to be accounted for so if you are refactoring that code, you might not want to go and change like how I literally just changed this test. I'm like, okay, I'm going to change that to input from calc. You might want to name this one like test calc, obviously factor these out to other files, like input in its own file, whatever, and maybe even more than that, but just do it at a slow pace like we're doing now where I brought everything kind of into one file and then I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, obviously this is going to need two or more files. So the next project you're on, if you know, like, hey, I know right now that if I bring those in, 
in five seconds, I'm going to want to factor them out one more time to the other file. That's cool because then you know in your mind you can like skip that stone. You know, you can skip that stepping stone because you've been there, done that, you know. So by doing this, it kind of just like gives you that concrete evidence in your mind that like, yeah, I can do this, but at the same time, you're still hugging that turn. You're still keeping it simple. So you're not letting that complexity, but you want to breathe. You want to, you know, like unbutton that button so that you can breathe and like it's striking that happy balance. Do you see that? Cause that's what I'm trying to, you know, I'm obviously not necessarily doing like the best example of it and none of us probably will, you know, that's part of the idea too, is that we're making mistakes as programmers as we go along and we want to be able to go back and tidy up those ends and also um, on the business end, so to speak, there's going to be changes there most likely. Um, so this works out good for, for both those examples. But anyway, so I think what I'm getting at there is, um, you know, in the real world, after you've done this once or twice, then don't feel bad about skipping some of this minutia where you know, like, okay, I really should just go ahead. In fact, like, obviously go ahead and do that. And also to be thorough about the testing, like, don't take it for granted. Like, oh, I'm doing quote unquote TDD now. So I can just hum along. And as long as it all works at the end of the day, because you don't want to lose anything, you know, you want to maintain that. The whole idea is like sort of a, uh, observing the system from a, in a certain state, from a certain perspective, um, and then making sure that it's doing equal or better to that after we make any changes. Mainly equal to it, but, you know, if there's an improvement, you know, who's to complain? Okay, so we've done that. Let's verify we've tested all that, that that's good and so we would just go in right here and just start filling in the blanks and under here start filling in more tests to hit the processing module from every angle and maybe that would turn into something of factoring that out into um, several different functions you know if it once you get too many passing too many parameters into a function then you might want to break it out we have our parameters hidden in an object so I don't see that being a problem anytime soon, but that's something that does appear from time to time. Okay, so now we are building with TDD. Uh, mislabeled comments over functions. We fixed that. Too many reasons for this file module to change. That's still there. Cleanup names, identifiers. They're good enough for now. Relocate global. So. The global's the last of the too many reasons to change thing that we, that I'm noticing right off the bat. I mean, this, did I get output console inputs? We need to test that output works real quick. And then we'll just Save some type in, and we're going to test console output of a dictionary. And assert that, what is the output one called? We'll call it display play calculate because prints are reserved and then we'll go uh, def put display calculate So this is taking a dictionary now. Oops. Calc. So this is supposed to be calling the calcul the processing 
calculate function. So right here we have to wonder, this is where we make another sort of mistracking my files here. Let me get the files that matter on the screen. Output matters. Um, it's getting a little tricky. It's not a big deal. I'm obviously not like a seasoned test driven development developer. Plus, we're going back and doing the legacy approach. So, what am I doing now? Test output, assert output, get console. I need to get rid of all that junk. Assert output dot display. Um, output dot display something. and just that that function returns true. Especially once you get to like the, some IO stuff, I just get stubby about it. So I don't like, you know, if you don't know like, whoa, how do I test the output? That's like a, one of those void statements maybe that doesn't even return something normally like a print statement, maybe in some languages or whatever. Like it's just, what do you do with it? And it's just make sure it returns true. Make sure that that module loads up it's got the function display, it takes a string, and it doesn't crash out when it gets it, you know? So it is ridiculously simple, but that's all we have to do. So, I mean, I could literally right now, if I literally wanted to stub this, I could just say return true. You know what I mean? Like, well, I'd have to like let it take the string in, but um, yeah, but I've we might as well just go ahead and make this real since this is our real thing and the output isn't going to, capture the um the input to where it won't block the input it won't block the test from running it shouldn't okay so display is just going to take a string and it's going to i should make that say string uh, and string i think is a reserved name so i could put the underscore or just better yet be descriptive about it what kind of a string is it and it's going to be um well, let's we'll just call it output, I guess. Console message. There's something stupid and wordy. Okay. Then we'll just come down here and say print console message. And any of this stuff, like when I first was getting into object oriented programming or whatever like stuff like that would just seem so redundant to me like oh man really I had to go to another file just to find this thing like slightly change the name of a function and pass that stupid name variable and do the same thing but it's like if you think maybe about what's not there that's what this is helping out with because now that we've done this and we pushed it to this output um, we're pushing everything out to these little concretions there, you know, the codes there, we have the, um, where's a good one processing. So we have like, you know, our interface and then we actually have our implementation there. And for now that works as a first step, that's fine. But going forward, what we'd want to do is if all of a sudden we're like, once we get to the GUI part, that's where this would be different because we'd sort of want to turn this first output into a middleman, so to speak, where it's going to decide maybe which uh, output we'll use. Or maybe, you know, that decision could be made in several places or in cooperation with different modules and stuff. It all That's all about that emergent architecture and which one works out best for you. But um, I, I tend to pit things that write in this main module, like things that, especially if they're not so much a testable thing, if it's more of just like, driving the program on a particular platform uh, with the user interface, 
then that's going to be your main program. That's what this is right here, right? So that's where I'm going to do any changes that I don't know where they should go. If it's not input specific, it's not output specific, it's not some backend processing module that we already have specific. And I'll just put it in here, a brand new function, you know, like, oh, we need a function to get the time and date or whatever. Um, but if we need to get it from input, then I might just throw it in there like that in the same manner. So if that makes sense, how these little ideas scale is just start at this little, this is basically the hello world module. You know, that's what this would have been if we would have started out with a hello world program and evolved it into this. So that's where you want to, if you don't know, start there. And then it's like, what's the next step? Well, the next step is those, um, those other modules, which we will need to bring into this import input. And if I've named anything the same as like a standard library, if you end up doing that, then just go back and change the name of that file. Just if you have it open, do that save as renaming trick or whatever. Um, if you're using one of the good editors, then it will usually change the color. Some of the stuff that's in the standard libraries, if they're not imported, then you're probably not going to see any special highlighting on those function names and whatnot. Okay, so now this... Our, so our program still depends on all this code. These are your dependencies up here. It's all this, these import and include style statements. That's what you depend on to run for that file. Did we test that console output? Return. Okay, so we need to go back to the main program. Go right here where it says console inputs, get console inputs, and then instead of print, we need to call output dot display. And then we're not gonna call calculate, right? No, we're gonna call calculate. So that will be processing dot calculate with the console inputs. Okay, that looks like that should work. So let me maximize that. So it's going to get the inputs from the console. Get console input has been moved to input. And so you can see everything's been factored out. And we could have done that um, import a mass star thing and then we wouldn't even have had to change the names, but for now, this seems like the most appropriate choice. So I'm gonna hit F5 on this. And that's the user testing module. So um, it's gonna be primarily tested by users, not test-driven development. So I think it said could not find module calc. Calculate processing. Should just run it again. Run. Module not found. No module named output. What did I name it? Output. Huh. File save as. Output. Click on it again. Save. Yes. All right, let's try that again now. F5. Five plus five. Name console massage is not defined. Where did I put? Let's look at that error. So console message is not defined. And then the last of this traceback thing was print console message in file output.py so we can go output.py print console message and there it is misspelled wrong just like that come back over to this one and run it all right finally and then we'll do the wrong operator and that works 
because we're not in the test. We're not running the test to test that it doesn't work. And that's one thing too is that um, where'd that go? Test calc. So this dollar sign right here, we're asserting, you know, we're catching the dollar sign right here. And one thing that might be easy in the beginning to do is say like, oh, okay, cool. We caught the dollar sign as the invalid operator and everything, but um, we're not doing anything about that. So it's one thing to kind of like stir up the ruckus with the test and catch that that ruckus, but then you want to do something to to strap it back down. So really what we should do is make a deal like somewhere along the line that catches that bad operator getting put in there and says, you know, that either loops back around and just requests another operator or actually says, hey, you know, um, one general idea that seems to have fared well over the decades is when stuff's going well, try and remain silent, you know, and then when something goes wrong, error and error loudly. So that's the idea we want to go for too. All right, so let's go ahead and run this again while we're here. Cool, and we got the assertion error invalid operator. Test to run. Um, go ahead and get that more. I'm going to go ahead. I think in Pepe, you're supposed to, for stuff that's against the rail, it's supposed to be double spaced against it. But um, I just want to make sure it all fits in a screen full for right now. Okay, so those tests are looking good. We have at least one test for input processing and output. Um, now we need to relocate this global near the stuff that cares about it. So the decimal places being formatted to uh, eight decimal places, where do you think that would go? Output. Print console message. So that's making me wonder now about So this is getting already more complicated than I want it to be. So that's a smell. That means I'm doing something wrong. So let's trace through it real quick and see what's going on here. So it's going to drop in. It's going to import our modules. And then it's going to come down. It's going to load this into memory. It's going to come down here and say, if it's the main module, which it is, so it's going to call main, um, it's going to drop into this loop, and the loop is saying, it's weird, it's not giving us a scroll bar at the bottom of the screen. The loop is saying console inputs goes to input, get console input, so that would be over here, go to input, get console input, which is going to create a dictionary, stack it up, and return it. And so right here, console inputs is going to be that dictionary. We're going to come down here. Console inputs is going to get passed into calculate and processing. Calculate and processing gets the inputs. It's going to do the math and return a number. And that number is going to go straight to the display output. So right here, we're still controlling. I should get rid of output kind of actually and right here where I had to like comb through it and I'm like wow it's not reading you know that's a code smell that whatever so maybe what we're doing isn't the best way to do it so we'll like like what's wrong with this line here like why doesn't it read console inputs equals input dot get console input so that's not too bad I mean it could definitely be better um, but down here one thing we could do is cut that out and just put it up here and then say processing.calculate. And obviously 
the one good thing about these wordy names and this simple example is that they can show you that they can represent like much more complex names. Um, I think these names are too wordy for being so simple, like in my opinion. I'd probably just change this to like calculator. Calculator. And then console inputs. In this section, who knows if it's a console like it's a desktop, so it could have um, a console or a graphical input. So we'll just call it inputs. And then what did I just take out of there? Processing, calculator, calculator inputs. And then output to, so calculator calculate inputs would be a we'd get a result there and then I'll put display result so there's some refactoring right there and I think it's made it easier to read so that's good and then we need to change this to calculator Calcul another one of those things where I thought like you know that might be too specific or something it's processing but as these things start to show calculate Calculator. What they are, then rename them early on if you can, and that will help because obviously there's going to be a, if this program were to grow and scale, there's probably going to be other backend processing modules. So we're not going to want to call them processing two or processor two or something like that. We want to get more descriptive. So to call this one a calculator, and when something has like some type of operator type of name to it, then it's good for composing it's good to, it's like a gadget you can just strap on and run with you know um, a refrigerator a barbecue or a uh, I don't know I can't think of anything else right now I'm gonna try and move on so input calculator output so we'll come over here to processing file save as then we'll change the name. No, we need to just slow double click it. And this will be calculator. Then click on it again and save over it. Yes. And just remember to make that change everywhere. So we'll just go ahead and do a uh, copy and repeat place processing with calculator replace fine replace fine replace so that should be it all right Close that, save that, and run it. Make sure the tests still work. No module, calculator. Cal spelt it wrong. File, save as. Run it. All right. So our tests run. That means all of our modules are at least in basic working order. And one of the things too is that, well, let me go ahead and check, let's start, comb through it. So we got our, load our imports get our main program rocking right here and we can really just cram it all together just like that if we want to so how many reasons does this file module have to change um, looks like if we change one of these things it's dependent on which that's a given if a module is dependent on something and that dependency changes at least the interface to that dependency um, 
if the dependency itself changes behind the scenes, you know, switches from a MySQL to a MongoDB database or something, that doesn't necessarily affect us unless our interface through that module changes. Um, if we're just handing it off a, a value to some function we've always called that's still there, that's going to take that value, we're fine. So this one, it only has to change if we're going to change our actual uh, output dependency. If we're going to bring in some different output module, then this would have to change. That's basically it. And if we want to maybe change like the order of our inputs, it's really narrowed down. It doesn't have a whole lot of different reasons to change. Um, and even if we want to change our output module, we could do that somewhere else outside of this. We could just do that in that output file right there. And this would never know. It would just be, um, it would just set up this, kick off this initial little choreography and then that's it, you know. So this is looking good so far. I, we don't see any standard library calls in here. Not that I'm seeing so that's good, at least in this main thing. Standard library call, calls aren't necessarily bad or anything, but by not having those, we're showing that we've got everything pretty well abstracted, even those standard library calls. So if they change, you know, like the print is a standard library call, but we might want to change that out. So by not calling print, we're calling our output display. Big deal, it's a print statement for now, but we can change that later. And this whole file right here, this could be worked on, you know, hypothetically, this could be worked on by one team on one side of the planet. This one could be worked on by another team on the other side of the planet because changes in this one shouldn't affect changes in this one and vice versa. You know, this person is writing their change against a test suite. They're not writing their change against the main entry file. So that's the way it is and the person who's writing the may or people or whatever they're writing or maybe robot in the near future um that are writing this are going to go by this interface you know they're going to have similar documentation as this and that's how they're going to compose this so that's how all this stuff goes such hand in hand it's insane it's like such a synergistic effect out of the test-driven architecture type of a thing. Test-inspired architecture, I should say. So this module does not have too many reasons to change. Um, we have relocated the... No, we haven't. Where does that global need to go? So, if we put the global here, now we've refactored enough to where we can see, like, hey, this is pretty pure. If we were to put that global format string right here, it would work, but now we have a reason to change that's kind of like bizarre you know like um we have an eight character display if we're using a graphical user interface we might have a 80 character display or whatever or vice versa like um so it just obviously doesn't belong there we want that eight character limitation pushed somewhere over here in the display but what should we do should we create another you know break this out into more files or functions or whatever and maybe in the future but right now if we can avoid it then we should avoid it so we know just sticking with what we had before um what is that called was decimal places and let's see if i remember it right i'm gonna save that and so this is just like it was as being a global over here except this is a little bit less global. Now this is only in this module right here. Um, well, sort of, you know, this, it's only going to be visible to this module and uh, other modules that know about it or dig for it. One thing we can do too in Python is prefix it with another underscore or a single underscore. And that means don't export this name. So if we, do that and do a save then we come over here um, it's not going to know about it in this file like 
they would have to intentionally like if we said import star and told it to bring in all the stuff from this one like if we had done that um, right here from output import star and then would have brought in display and it would have brought in decimal places without the prefix if we hadn't put that there and then we could just say decimal places and that format string thing would pop up but by putting that prefix on there, if we did that and for, brought, imported the star and everything, then it would act like it couldn't find decimal places. We would have to say output dot underscore decimal places, and then we could still get to it. So that's one of the things with Python is they say, don't ever think there's a truly private variable, but I mean, give me a break. It's a high level like scripting language or whatever, you know, you can't have much expectation for that, but uh, it does a reasonable job. And then there's the double underscore one where that's for subclasses. Um, subclasses will still inherit that if you're doing a class-based system. They'll still inherit that little underscore uh, identifier. It won't be hidden to them because it's not an export. So by doing a double underscore uh, prefix only on the prefix would do uh, that's a that will mangle the name. So it will just make it so that if you happen to use the same name in a subclass, you'd really you're less likely, a lot less likely to step on that name if it's similar. So anyway, just some ideas to keep in mind here. And I'm already starting to get lost myself. So what we had to do here was pit decimal places and then the uh, percent sign. And then we have our console message. So that's that should format our thing to eight decimal places just like it was before. So now we've relocated that global near the um, near where it goes. So this is looking good. Now that only has that reason to change right there in that file. So, and then if this could get all this and this could get pushed out to like maybe either a console display specific function or console display specific file eventually after that maybe. Um, and you know that information would stay together and get refactored together but it's on it's all based on revisits refactoring is about revisiting the code and then going how could i kind of shift that so i mean if we look over here now our here's our main program we got input processing and output and we come down here the main entry point which is so obvious we don't even need to comment which is good save this and this is all just looking fairly pythonic we come down here and we hit that line and run that, come up here, enter this infinite loop, which eventually I'll be a feature fix to uh, add some cleaner way of exiting the program. Let's try it out real quick, F5. Right, so that works. I'm just going to close that so our main program works where it's at right now. Decimal places, this is our output. It's all working how it's at right now. So those could be another country working on them. Processing, it's looking good. We still have our comments there. We're not really dealing with result none. That should be put into a test of like figure out what happens when we get to that. And really, if you run into stuff like document it somewhere, preferably for your project, like in some public spot, you know, file an issue if you have to, whatever, just get it documented, jot a note right in front of you, put a little comment in the source code or whatever. But all those little things you think of like, oh, that testing, that none type as I don't document it right now. So, so I'll come over here and say test. Um, I could just even throw in like a commented out one like test and that would have been in calculator none type or something like that you know and I won't even put the things on it so I know it's not even implemented something like that just so maybe so that that's like there and then I could even maybe do like a to do Okay, and now this has made it so console inputs looking good. We 
get rid of that. Just made it so we can add the GUI now. So for now, we'll just try and add it right in the same uh, deal where to go. So it, our cal it's going to be input for now. We'll just do a quick and dirty, really quick and dirty one. So get console input is going to have to get changed. Or that's going to stay get console input. We're going to change it to just in general get input. And then get input will call up here. We can just set a flag. And setting a flag in any sort of modern programming is kind of a code smell too. Like, really? Are you setting a flag? That's like last century. We should probably find out a different way to do it. But for now, just to keep everything like super simple, uh, we're going to say GUI equals true. And then what this will do is this will say if GUI is true if GY then we're gonna say get GY input else get console input so right there you can see how we're picking which one we want to do and so our def GUI input get okay so before we do this we should probably yeah I know I just want this window okay we need to import so TK or Python the standard graphical interface thing is called TK it's part of the TCL TK toolkit. It's just kind of a lean in, easier, beginner friendly uh, graphical widget toolkit. It was considered really ugly for a long time, but the thing is, there were it's been updated, so it's not as ugly as it was. But a lot of people don't realize it because there's so much old documentation floating around that even once it got updated, that people didn't realize it. And then it took Python a minute to catch up with that I think or at least the documentation or something so it's like most documentation even to this day like a while later doesn't seem to cover the more modern interface but anyway that's what it is it's the graphical widgets that you'd expect on stuff like this drop down menus and um, when you open up a thing you know you get your buttons and images and labels links whatever so in python the inner the wrapper is called tk enter so we could just say import tk enter if we wanted to but i'm going to say actually from tk enter just import oh i'll do star right now to keep it quick so you can do this with the tk stuff um especially if you're keeping your stuff cleanly separated like we are into clean namespaces and whatnot, then you should be able to just, and the way TK enters design is it's just a bunch of classes and some constants. So you don't have those lowercase instantiated variables. You do that on your own. So if you've got your own clean little module where you're, you know, it has a single responsibility, which is the GUI, then you should be able to just dump these right into your namespace. Okay. So anyway, we do that, and then it's really easy to get rocket. Like, we can literally just create, like, a button, and then pack is a geometry manager that throws it on the form after it's created. And here it's minimized, but there it is. There's a little, just like an OK button or whatever. It's not labeled. Let's go ahead and do the same thing and give it a label. So we say text equals OK. And then do that and then there you can see it's an okay button so that's kind of just to show how things get kicked off and 
this sort of uses the forms and widgets, or maybe it's called forms and buttons. Martin Fowler has a write-up he started probably 15 years ago or something about MVC and da 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 architecture and all that. And I think it's a good article, especially in the fact that it's not finished. That really says a lot about all that architecture fluff anyway. Um, but this seems to follow the first sort of architecture he just tries to describe, which is like Visual Basic, if you remember that, or anything like the forms and buttons. You just basically create these forms and attach some logic to it and stuff like that. And not really trying to get too crazy architectural about it, but if you want to, you can abstract stuff away. But anyway, I wanted to show how easy that can be done. And then, so what we can do is we can say like four I in range zero to up to, but not including 10. So it'll be zero through nine. For that, we're gonna create a button and we're gonna call it that number, the number I and uh, And then I'm just going to pass it. I can pass an expression for a command. Command lambda. And then we'll just tell it print. Print i. And then we'll automatically pack that. So this stuff, whatever, we already threw those references away. So that's almost like we didn't type those lines anymore. Um, this stuff's still imported until we reset the shell. So basically this is the only line of code we need to focus on right now. And this first thing's the for, which is for loop. And it's just saying for the value zero through nine effectively. This right here is the button class, uh, which we'll call the button class constructor and it's going to create a new button widget object and we're going to pass the text i which will the first iteration through will be zero and then for the command of when we click that button we're going to make it say print what i is and then it's going to pack that onto the form which basically just stuffs it in the little window so to speak right now um, and then it's going to come back through and then this is going to equal one and Da, 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 all through it but check this out let's do that and then we see right here we get our buttons and we can click them and we get a nice little print but the problem is they all say nine so what the problem here is that the lambda expression that I used is pulling I out of the environment so it's always nine it the last after it ran through all this i equals nine and then lambda's going back into this environment to um to get the value and that's why it's nine so what we can do instead is we can actually create actually let me get rid of that okay what we could do it says create a function a function like creator the function factory and this will be create oh, we'll just call it create function for now and it's going to take one value it's going to take a number or whatever I mean it's kind of a number for now it could be the plus operator or whatever and then we're going to say inside of that we're going to create another function we'll just call it function and this function we'll do what we wanted the lambda one to do, which was print, print in is what we're gonna call it now. It's I, but it's getting passed in, so it will be in. Okay, and then that's all we want to do for now. Simplest thing, make sure it works, and we need to return this function. So what's going on here, this is called a closure, and I normally kind of like shy away from these, but I was like trying to figure out what should I do to uh, create this? And I actually tried the closure before the Lambda, and then I went and tried the Lambda, and I was happy it didn't work right out of the gate because I 
perf I don't like lambdas, and I honestly don't like closures that much either. I prefer, especially in object-oriented programming. Anyway, they just they make it really vague because we're passing in this value, and what happens over here will change this. Okay, let me save this in, and we'll talk about it. So go back up a couple to this one, and instead we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to call that closure function instead. Create function. And we're going to pass it that i. Okay, and now you'll see. Now it's printing the numbers for all of them. So that's good. That's what we wanted it to do. Cool. And they're all nice looking little button numbers. Not really arranged just like a calculator, but we're getting somewhere with just a few lines of code. So this is basically, besides those two import statements, this is what we have for code right now. Um, so it's come, we can ignore this for now. This is our define create function closure thing, and it goes into memory. Then we come down here and start running the 0 through 9, 10 iterations. Um, we're going to create a button with the text that has the number, and then we're going to call this create function, and we're going to pass it the current number that we're on, and then finally we're going to add it to the form. Um, so we're going to call this create function with zero, and what it's going to do is it's going to create, that's a lot like, um, I'm wanting to type in there, so uh, control N, oops. So that's a lot like coming up here and saying like local value equals N, and then calling this like local value. But actually this is a, what's called a non-local non -local value. Um, but right out here it's local to this function. This is local to this function, but this is non-local to this function because it's outside of it. It has to be in here or in here to um, be local to it, right? So, so what happens with the closure, um, that's just effectively like it's kind of like doing that, like assigning that, and you know, like if we thought about it like that. So it comes in here, it passes this in into this namespace in here, and then this inner function absorbs that name because that's the way that a lot of like nested functions and stuff like that in languages, if you pay attention to it, you'll see that they a lot of times they can absorb the the outer, the non-local scope. So, um, and then utilize it. And this is one of those situations where that's saving us a lot of typing because otherwise the way that TK is kind of set up is that when you want to do something, each button is tied to a command. You know, we're going through and we're, um, where was I? So we're going through and we're assigning a command to each button. So what we'd have to do if I didn't do this trick with the closure is we'd have to create like command one, command two, command three. We'd have to create a function for each one of those commands. So the only variance I was seeing between them was like one value, one parameter, the the number on the button. Otherwise it's a button that represents a number or whatever, you know. So like if, if you can see that commonality where there's just one or very few differences, that's where a closure might be a good way to just sort of like wrap those differences out around that function. And then the function can act as though they were like hard coded within itself. Anyway, if that makes any sense, but they're also, they kind of like hide the value a little bit. That's why all this stuff, it's good to lean into that turn and stay on the easy path because there's going to be a little bit of hiding, but this is saving us like potentially pages of typing, um, you know, and if it's just like, okay, we wrap our head around like literally five lines of code, you know, six lines of code maybe or whatever. It's just, that's not, that's right at that limit. That's like, okay, that's not too much to ask. That shouldn't be. And if it is, then just rename it something like right here. We named it at least something kind of descriptive. I feel like that's only halfway there though. Like that should be something more like that should be like create button uh, or create calculator button or something. Okay. 
so that's that and then we just got to build up in our input if that then get console input so if they do this then we want to import tk enter and then from tk enter import star and then just fire that thing up so what we normally do is we do a root tk what it's doing is when we created the button it's automatically creating this like that's that forms the form and buttons style thing it just has to create a root window that's going to have your tcl interpreter that interprets all these tk commands behind the scenes um just to kind of do this once for the program at the beginning and just calling it root i don't like that name at all but it's just short and simple and it's kind of the custom is for people to call it but it really should be called like root window so i'll even call it root window for now but I've even, as much as I hate adopting practices like that, I just call it root. Um, and then we should title it right there too, but I'm going to leave leave all that out for now. So that, and then we'll just go ahead and undo our thing where we say uh, for range 0 to 10. And for that range, we're going to do... Um, we're not even going to name the button right now. And we can add this parameter to make sure it goes to that root window. So we'll do that. And then what the button's going to have the text and it's going to equal I. And then it's going to have a command that's going to equal create button function and then we could actually even just put all these buttons in something that matters like I could create like a a button list and start adding them to that but for right now I'm not even going to do that. It's not even necessary, so don't even do that. And we'll just pack them straight on there as they're made, too. Okay. Save that. What's this about? Okay. Um, so this is in our input. So get GUI input. We could even start it. We should really have tested test-driven development on that. So test input def test um, GUI input for dictionary and what we want to make sure is that if we call input dot get GUI input and we'll just check the same one the OP because you figure this kind of testing for the presence of the operator thing whatever is not equal to dollar sign and even that is not dry that is no longer dry because up there we have that same thing, right? Let me maximize this. We have that same thing up there. And so I'm going to make this even not dry. But for right now, it's just one, you know, it's just a foul ball or whatever. So one or very few occurrences is like, okay, whatever. But this is all stuff I'm going to have to delete and retype or whatever maybe in the future. So um, if you start seeing that, it's like, Maybe I should just make a thing where I the function called invalid operator and then takes a parameter or something and can return whatever. It's just a something to consider, things to consider. Okay, so 
we're basically just running the same exact test on the GUI input, which, huh, yeah, print, And then we need to actually run this test too. So put it down here, test to run. We already know that. I'm gonna go ahead and put that one out for now. Normally uh, you'd wanna leave them all in. Actually, I should just leave it in. If you're gonna put it out, put it out. So we're, that's a shell, we'll get rid of that. So we should be able to just test it now. Invalid syntax to get GUI input. What does it need? I better run that one more time. Or get you a file. Line 22 in input pi. Down here is the little, I can enable line numbers, but they look really ugly on here. Get console input. Get GUI input. I don't get what's. What am I missing here? Get G if GUI get GUI input line twenty two invalid syntax. Oh I left the stupid thing in there. It's a bad thing about self proclaimed polyglot just messing with too many different languages at once to Making too many stupid mistakes in all of them. All right, where's the test at? Test F5. Import star only allowed at module level. It's good to know. Wrong thing. Well, totally bad practice, but do it for right now because there's not the whole one reason to change thing going on in here just yet and even if there was with testing that doing this module wide stuff can get can get weird potentially um, so that's that jump back over and so it passed the test and then create bunk so the first test passed but the second one, name, create button function is not defined on line 19. Test. Or was that input? Yeah. Input. What is the problem again? Um, button, da, da 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 name create bun button function, create button function, where were we getting that from? We need to create the button, we need to create the create button function. So that will need to come before this one. And it's kind of like a helper function. Wait, that shouldn't be in here. Oh yeah, this is right now, keeping it on the simple side. This I was like, wait a minute, this is, should be testing because I'm my mind's telling me, rightfully so, I think that, you know, this should be in a separate file than that console up here. This is giving me like huge smells. Um, 
but anyway I'm trying to just keep it simple for the moment so right here yeah we imported the TK enter stuff import TK enter TDK this uh, it's saying that create bump function Yeah, in the input module, we're not in the test module. Okay, starting to get confused. So I'll just go right above it right here for now. Def. But this is telling me right now, this is like saying split it apart. And I'm already at least filling strike two on that. So create button function. Oh, and then it needs to take a variable function. Print. Let's do that for now to make sure it's working. And then, okay, actually code that right since we're not in the REPL. Return function. And then give that a double space to well, no, not for now. Yeah. Shit. Okay. Okay, that should work. And we'll go back to the test. F5 to run that. Creep on function, one per parameter missing, of course. Save, go back to test at five. None type object is not scriptable. Subscriptable. Oh, that was the one. Wait. Better reread that error. So type error none type object is not subscriptable. Line 17 of test calc. Did I do an object to make it none type? I don't get how that. Oh, because the GUI is not doing anything. Okay. There we go. Yeah, testing GUIs is not normal in at this level in test-driven development. Um, get GUI input. So that's not blocking. That test is going to have to be. Um, what this is doing is this is just. Get GUI input. It's going to input and it's calling this one, get GUI input, which is creating a root window and all those buttons, and then it's going right back. And it's not returning a specific value. So that's the problem there with that one, is that that needs to. Um, it needs to block and then return a value for that test. But anyway, I can't believe how much time I spent on this. But I'm glad, kind of, I didn't want to go, like, really fast and be all talking, like, whatever, you know. So it was like, well, take forever and just try and be more patient or whatever. And I didn't know how it was going to go when I sat down to do this. I thought it was going to be quicker and dirty, but it's just been slow and dirty, so... If you've stuck around this long, obviously you care, and honestly, I'm not here to please the masses. I'm just here to please, you know, try and help people who really care about this stuff and improve myself at the same time, and, um, you know, any comments or suggestions or just, like, if there's any alternatives of ways you do it or if I don't see something stupid or whatever, slap me around. I don't care, you know. I do that to other people plenty. I, 
people should do it to me more. Um, I appreciate that I'm given some slack and, you know, like I've done stupid stuff on these videos where I'm like, wow, I should delete, I shouldn't even post that, you know, or whatever, but I'm like, whatever, I'll just put it up there. But yeah, anyway, so thank you for your patience and stuff like that. If you can see, I, I still want to continue this. I just want to break it up more. I didn't, I was planning on, I've been working on this GUI stuff. Um, I've been relearning the TK thing. So that, uh, I've just been kind of getting in depth with that and really taking that to the next level further than I did the last time that I dove into all that. So I just decided, you know what, I want to jump over and get the next thing out and just straighten some stuff up and I thought oh maybe I could whip out a little thing but I mean I kind of showed I demonstrated how how you can get that that kicked off initially but I want to maybe think about how I'm going to do this you know so maybe you could think about like how would you refactor some of this stuff too so looking at what we have here we have our tester let's open some stuff stuff back up open recent got test input calculate file open uh, output so let's just do our look at our input processing and output kind of thing oh yeah we got to open calc to file open that good old calc file there we go. So we open our program and it just comes right on in there. It's... And that's still looking good. And it just imports those modules. And so if this was like an Android program or something, of course we'd probably convert it to another language until Grail VM finally takes off and can probably be able to program in Python on Android too then, but what we could do is we could just, this would be a different entry point, you know, off the main launcher or whatever, you'd come in and you would just go into some other class file instead of, you know, like a class files fairly analogous to like a module in Python. Um, that's actually the thing with that graphical interface that I was wanting to do too was to where'd that go? That's input. Um, push that out into its own module because one thing a lot of people do, especially even with this TK stuff, is they'll start making like classes and objects and then they do a really bad job at creating the classes and so it just adds it's nothing but complexity. These modules, these Python module files, um, they're basically like a singleton class, if you're familiar. And that's one thing, too. If you start, if you know, if you're familiar with design principles and those are starting to pop into your mind right now, that's a good thing. You know, I'm not trying to go there because design principles are a little bit more refined, a little more re robust in general. So um, I think on one hand, maybe it's kind of good to sort of like seek out the answer on your own and maybe even go look at what other people are doing and then you're going to find something that's going to start to line up with a, some kind of design principle and then you can go from there with that sort of adventure it's kind of like the way that i've looked gone into learning music was at the very first when i was a kid people were trying to teach me to read music notation and stuff like that and then try and get really good at that at first and then turn to the instrument and like really a rote learning method, but um, I found it a lot easier to eventually just learn a few chords and go that route. And so it was like, oh, give me three chords. I can just strum these in different arrangements, get, you know, then I can build up the muscle memory and all that kind of stuff without trying to build it up on the dull little sticky stuff and just do that. And then once I start thinking, okay, I'd like to throw in another chord or whatever. Then I could start looking at like, okay, well, what notes are in that scale or whatever, you know, in that key. Like you can look at things like that and start to say, okay, now I can go look at this hardcore, more hardcore theory stuff or more concrete evidence or whatever and see what I can bring in or like try and identify what I've just found or whatever. 
so that's kind of like the way I think the better approach to this than to and plus design patterns are just explained wrong by everybody they are almost everybody and even if they aren't um, the very few if ever times that they are explained right it's just hard to get it anyway so um, that's that's the thing with those so I would my goal is to eventually master at least the 23 gang of four design patterns and um, be able to like explain those a little bit better I think gang of four for the most part does I feel like they do a good job with it I know their their explanations are out there but um, head first for design patterns I just I don't think that's a reputable book honestly that's just me People say they love it and everything, but go look at them. Go look at the design patterns. Are you really creating good design patterns or like identifying good times to use them or not? I have to doubt it. Not if you're saying that's a good book because it's just not going to tell you the right times to use them and stuff. Um, it's basically when you just, when you've got to create a something, a, a design pattern fills in the missing gaps in your language. So when you have to go and create something like in, in the C programming language before C++, if you want to create something like an object um, with, you know, behavior and state within the same like data structure, you'd have to create function pointers and then go create a function somewhere. And you would have to do stuff like that to where you're actually like doing this boilerplate code just to create the notion of an object, uh, you know, that has state and behavior. And so what object-oriented programming does is it comes along and says, hey, just just put them all together in curly braces or at the same indentation level or whatever like this. And then it just sort of gives you that almost for free. And so that's the way that the language paradigms and evolutions happen. And so these uh, so-called design, software design patterns, most of them are things that the most ideal language, you just type very few characters and you'd be done. You know, it, w it would look so simple. You'd be like, what pattern? It would just be like an idiomatic statement in the language instead of like building up these little constructs that need to interact in a particular way or whatever. So anyway, those are just there to help us. Like when we get to a point where we're like, well, I want to know whenever that value it, over in Ireland changes on that server, I want it to print on my display over here, you know, so it's like, well, how are you going to solve that problem? Are you going to constantly ping that value? You know, constantly pull that value to see what it is? So it's like, well, how often do you want to do that? You know, once every three seconds? You want to send a ping all the way to Ireland and stuff? And Or would you like the Ireland server to just send you one ping when that value changes? So you can go from, you know, eight zillion pings a day down to one or a few pings a day so there's different trade-offs like that you know but you might be in a situation where that server doesn't have outgoing permission and the only ways to have ingoing permission or something you know ingoing access so you might have to pull it whatever there's all those trade-offs all those things i'm going to shut up now we have everything in separate modules so when we want to go to find out about inputs, we can go here. This input is where all the smell is now that I'm seeing. If you aren't, it's going more than a screen full. It has more than one reason to change because if we want to change the graphical input, it's got to change from the console. So the next thing I'm going to go and do in here, I can tell um, from my stance, from my as a programmer in my little closet refactoring stance, I'm going to go in here and change this around and I'm not going to let anybody tell me otherwise because they would just be telling me not to do my job right you know it's like somebody telling you to sweep it under the rug and but all this stuff like I'm really happy with the main and this was where the ugliness was and this has become the most beautiful thing so that's cool thanks a lot you rock if you've listened this far you've rocked I don't care if you're a beginner if you've just put up with all this, that's rad. If you're an expert and you've, you know, set down your crown to like, just take a look at this and whatever, totally appreciate it. And I would love any feedback whatsoever. I don't care about praise. I don't need that. You know, 
I appreciate that, but I don't need any praise at all. Um, I come from that scientific engineering critical feedback type of mentality where it's like punch holes in my theories, punch holes in my statements. Tell me where I'm screwing up because, or just even if it's not necessarily, you know, hardcore like that, just, you know, maybe you have a different way of doing it or something, or maybe you'd like to question a different way of doing it. Maybe I'll consider that in the next video. Who knows? Anyway, thanks again.